It'll taste pretty potent for a while, and you can smell it, but by tomorrow, by the ne day after, completely integrated flavors, and uh, wait, somehow it just tastes better than any of the beef stew I've had. Huh, I have so. to try that the next day. Yeah, it is really surprising, actually, because I messed around with it a little bit, and I just found it, like, the first hit is, like, so powerful. Mm -hmm. But then it is. It's really have you tried the puree? It's fast integrate. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. have. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, we've had, had it straight. <laughs> we've had salsa. <laughs> yes, we have had salsa. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, sea greens are a challenging ingredient. And I wrote a whole cookbook on this. Yes. Developed 125 yeah. recipes that you did that worked. And they're good recipes. And there were a lot of recipes that didn't work. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. to get to 125 was. Uh, there's a lot of things that just didn't work that don't fit yeah. uh, the American palate, mm -hmm. you know, even my adventurous palate. Um, but one thing I did notice is you know, there was an intense period of recipe testing for that. And when we were done with that period, when I stopped eating sea greens uh, consistently, mm -hmm. you know, at least once a day, if not a couple times a day, uh, I started to realize, to notice that foods were missing something after I stopped incorporating. Interesting. In the same way that if you if you cook with salt all the time, and then all of a sudden somebody's like, all right, you know, your doctor says, quit it, bud. Yeah. You're going to notice it really quick. Something's missing. Um, so secrets are something we we do need to train ourselves to like. But we're Americans. We have to train ourselves to like vegetables. For you know, and this, this, we we, like we we we've got we've got some food gym to get to, to exercise anyway. So you know, right. throw this into the mix, make it charismatic, and tell the story. Why sea greens matter? Yeah. You know, why this is a new entrant into the marketplace, and you know, connect it to provenance and connect it to purpose. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to make, I, I hadn't, I mean, we've been talking about the, you know, the, the economic piece and why the, the fishermen, uh, you know, support this endeavor and it fits well into, you know, lobster fishing off season and so on. Uh, I hadn't connected it to the consumer being interested in it from, for, from the social good, right, aspect. Like I, I was thinking you sell it because it's nutritious. People like healthy things, right? So there's that whole piece. But uh, so selling the you know the social responsibility aspect of it as a as a food, it fits in with the whole local you know, eat local movement. Yeah, I mean people, you know, we I like that word. as as imbued with this and as representative of the civic virtues and values as the yeoman farmer, the agrarian hero. So too are the men and women of Iron Spirit who toil upon the tumultuous waves of the North Atlantic. You know, they are virtuous Americans who nobly provide for our tables. And you tell that story, people will buy it. Right. It resonates. Why do you think the, you know, the Asian culture adopted it so much more readily than, say, the coastal American culture? You know, we grew up with a fishing, seafaring culture. Uh, but the, sea, you know, the whole seaweed piece was just left off the table. Well, uh, there, there's some complex sort of anthropological yeah, and, sure, and social sure. histories involved in this. And, you know, the immigrant populations that, uh, you know, became America, that, that really, you know, are the building blocks of, of who... So, this was a land of such unbelievable riches and resources. I mean, people came here and found cod and fish so thick that they could walk dry shod across rivers, you know, so quotes yeah. John Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they found you know, forests, virgin forests of timber that Europe hadn't seen in a thousand years. They found, you know, rivers that literally sparkled with gold. Like, look at that! There's, you know... Yeah. and. A land so vast of fertile, you know, prairie land that it was literally a, a physical manifestation of the political freedoms we sought. And so, in the face of abundance, 
uh, I think we as a culture just always looked for something else. We, we looked to, to the land, and, and that was part of our aspiration. Um, and if you live on an island, right. there's, <laughs> there's a sense, there's an inherent sense of limitation yeah. Yeah. and an inherent sense of uh, sort of thrift. Um, right. And, you know, and meat has always been an aspirational food stuff. Mm. And the only limitation to eating meat is the ability to dedicate large swaths of fertile land to growing silage. Right. But if, you, if you've got basically Ohio West, you know, why not? And that's what we found. And, uh, yeah. So we sort of shifted our culinary and cultural attentions towards more manifest destiny yeah. rather, yeah. Than, rather than our maritime history. You've been... My kids eat it a lot. <laughs> Whereas, you know, my parents don't, right? So there's that... Generational divide. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I think that generationally there are sort of decadal oscillations in, in the way that we right. uh, think about food. Yeah. You know, my grandmother, you know, doesn't, didn't know what processed food was. Mm -hmm. And just imagine the shift that's happened within two generations to where we are now. Sardines were once you know, the most popular food stuff in America. Right. You know, 28 canneries operating in, along the coast of Maine alone. And now it's like, name a disgusting food on, you know, on Family Feud. <laughs> Sardines. You know. <laughs> you know, opinions, opinions shift and, yeah. and change. Yeah, and right. I think that uh, introducing it through the snack food, through the nori chips, just right. getting the idea out there mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this is food, uh, it just opens up the mind, it opens up the palate, but it, um, it's going to take a little while. Yeah. It, it's, not, uh, it's not an obvious, there, there's no obvious path to adoption mm -hmm. for this, other than uh, integration into the foods we're already familiar right. with. Right. Right. And that's uh, one of the things I say is sort of sell the dish, not the fish, uh -huh. and this fits right into that. Right. Layer a little bit into your lasagna. Right. So what am I selling you? Lasagna. lasagna. <laughs> That's all you need to know, Garfield. You love lasagna. <laughs> you, know? you would never know. Right. So, right. It, um, but I think once the this the story and the civic values and the the green halo idea, you know, the fact that we suffer a huge anxiety over whether we are managing a world of abundance or are we managing it for scarcity? Mm -hmm. And when you start talking about an environmental story that says, that starts off with good human good, mm -hmm. you know, this is restorative, this is, you know, we should be doing more of this, it, it entirely shifts the narrative right. from guilt to opportunity. And that's, that's what's so exciting about these products. And then cool. add on to it how good growing it is for the ocean and all of the restorative effects, right, that it has yeah. for the ocean. It's a mildew situation. Yeah, I mean, just think about the in, you know, the beginning of the environmental movement, which was, you know, can we, can we stop having rivers that are on fire? Right. <laughs> to now, hey, can we eat more of a nutritious, delicious food that improves the quality of the environments in which we live and thrive? Yeah. Radical shift. Yep. And, and that's the right direction to be heading in. Absolutely. Well, man, thank you. Thank you. Uh, My pleasure.